Hi, I'm Brian, and welcome back to our series of Going to the Source. Today, the source we're going to be looking at is what we like to refer to as, as John Smith's list of what you're going to need if you're going to Virginia. source we're looking at today comes to us from none other than Captain John Smith, who of course had extensive world experience before even coming here to Virginia, having served militarily in various theaters across Europe uh, as a soldier and then an officer, and then of course several years of experience here at Jamestown, and then following that, uh, just a few years later, uh, experience, further experience in uh, the New World, exploring the coastlines of New England. So, with such extensive experience as an adventurer, to use the 17th century term, uh, both in general and here in Virginia, uh, he saw fit to include in one of his many publications a packing list of sorts. So basically, all of the things that he feels are necessary for a person to be successful in Virginia. All the stuff that you're going to need to bring with you from England. Uh, mostly for your existence in the colony, but also a, a few things to help you on the, the voyage over as well. And he refers to that list as a particular of such necessaries as either private families or single persons shall have cause to provide to go to Virginia, whereby greater numbers may in part conceive the better how to provide for themselves. Basically saying, this is, this is my advice. You want to know what to bring with you to Virginia? This is what I advise. And what we're going to be looking at today is the portion of that list that applies specifically to apparel. Everything you're going to need to wear uh, in Virginia. And he suggests a Monmouth cap, three falling bands, three shirts, a waistcoat, a suit of canvas, a suit of frieze, a suit of cloth, three pair of Irish stockings, four pair of shoes, a pair of garters, and one dozen of points. And uh, what we're going to do now is take a closer look at all of that and talk about what exactly that means. So to start with, what we're going to do is basically go through what we would think of today as, as the underwear. Uh, so he says you want three shirts. Uh, your, your linen shirt is going to be one of the less expensive garments in the time period. It's, they're not typically closely tailored. The pattern is most commonly just a, a, a combination of rectangles. They're intended to be, I guess you could say, the most disposable clothing item. It's your underwear during the day, keeping your skin off of your outer clothes, which are going to be much more difficult to launder, and especially much more difficult to launder without causing a lot of wear and tear to them. So your shirt is your underwear during the day, keeping you off of your outer layers, taking the soil from your body so your outer layers don't. And it's your, your pajamas at night, essentially. It's your night shirt as well. Uh, so it makes sense that you're going to want more than one because you're going to be getting them gross. It's against your skin all the time. You need one, uh, you need several to be able to rotate through as they launder, uh, as they launder them very heavily uh, and quite frequently. Um, you know, we often have these misconceptions uh, that everyone was just gross all the time uh, in you know the olden days. Um, and while certainly their ideas of hygiene are in many cases quite different from ours today, they had very specific ideas of hygiene. And that included clean linen against the skin. So you're going to need those three shirts to make sure you've always got a clean shirt to rotate through. Um, and in addition to that, he says three falling bands, the linen color, uh, which is going to keep us off of the collar of the doublet. You know, if you've ever, you know, looked close at the inside collar of maybe one of your old, you know, winter coats that's gotten a lot of wear, the inside of the collar starts to get kind of grubby after a while. But again, if that's the collar of your doublet, you don't want to have to put wear and tear on, on washing that constantly if you can avoid it. And so the falling band is there, um, can be stitched or pinned onto the doublet or the shirt. Um, to provide that barrier between your skin, your face, your beard, you know, what have you, um, and, and the doublet collar. Uh, 
Um, so again, keep the doublet clean. Um, once again, with that falling band, you know, made of linen, it, just like the shirt, easily launderable, easily replaceable when it does finally wear out from laundering, uh, as compared to your more finished, you know, outer garments, woolen garments, and that sort of thing. Um, and of course, we've got uh, one here that has a decent amount of, of wear on it. It's got two days of wear on it. And you can see, you wouldn't want that on your doublet. You know, you're going to uh, you're gonna you're gonna want uh, to be able to launder that away. And that's again, that's two days of, of wear with that little bit of grime there. Um, so again, easy to see why they're wearing falling bands. Um, it looks often, from a modern perspective, a bit superfluous. It looks kind of funny from a modern perspective. Um, some in the time period are quite extravagant and give you kind of a, a, a head on a platter sort of look. Uh, but again, it starts with that function of keeping the grime off of the clothes that you want to avoid laundering too often. Uh, and so a very practical, uh, very practical piece there. Uh, and again, he says three of those so that you can rotate just like the shirts, keep them laundered, keep them repaired. Uh, so that's that's pretty much it for your what we might think of as, as your underwear. He then moves on to three pair of Irish stockings. So you can see I've got three pair of these Irish stockings here. Um, and it is simply a uh, you know a heavyweight woolen uh, cut cloth, woolen rather than knitted uh, stocking. And uh, in this case, again, made, made of very, very heavyweight cloth. Um, the exact construction will vary, you know, there's no real standardization with any of this, uh, but that's gonna be the typical for I, what, what are specified as Irish stockings. Uh, you also see them referred to as cut hose or bag hose in the time period, but uh, it's, it's a heavy duty stocking. Um, and one of the things I always found interesting was it, he says three pair of stockings and four pair of shoes. So for a long time, before I actually came to understand what Irish stockings were, I thought three pair of socks and four pair of shoes, why on earth? I mean, socks wear out really fast, and they can when you're wearing lighter weight, especially knitted stockings. Uh, wear holes in the heels and holes in the toes and that kind of thing, and certainly leather-soled shoes wear out and need repair more uh, rapidly than a lot of modern styles of shoe but I was still perplexed as saying, I wear socks out a lot faster than shoes. But coming to an understanding, these Irish stockings, these are tough. These are hard wearing, long lasting. Um, and uh, one of these pairs, in fact, I've got three years worth of three season wear on and they have finally just now worn a hole in the sole of one of those stockings. Whereas in the meantime, all of my shoes have had to be resold at least once in that same time frame. Um, so it gives us a better insight into why only three pair of Irish stockings, uh, but four pair of shoes, as you're gonna wear through those shoes a little faster. I had also wondered for quite a while, why four pair of shoes and not any heavier footwear, boots and that sort of thing. Certainly there's expense to be considered. Boots are going to be more expensive than shoes. But uh, when you look at all the rest of the things that are uh, that, that John Smith has included on his his list of suggestions, he's not exactly sparing expense. Uh, and so, if he considered it to be practical or necessary, certainly we, we have to assume he would have included it. So I had wondered why so many shoes, no boots. But again, now having experience with these heavy, heavy stockings. It makes a lot more sense now. These are nearly boots unto themselves. So having something, you know, enough to attach a sole to the bottom of that of that Irish stocking, uh, really is going to be sufficient for most circumstances that that uh, that soldier, that adventurer, that colonist uh, are going to run into. So it makes a lot more sense when we look a little closer at the nature of uh, of that clothing item. Uh, and then, of course, because no elastic, you're going to need your garters uh, to hold those up as well. Um, garters come in a wide variety. These are knitted. You'll see uh, woven fabric tape essentially used as, as garters as well. Um, mine are undyed, but uh, you know you see them dyed in a wide variety of colors uh, as with, with any of this, especially the woolen stuff. 
uh, well, takes dye really well, and so uh, you know, colorful clothing was actually quite popular in the time period. Again, we tend to have misconceptions that everything was drab and dreary and kind of colorless in you know the olden days, but they're really into bright, garish, garish, exciting colors. They're just as concerned about fashion as we are today. And while to a certain extent we might look at a list like this as being a little bit more utilitarian they're still going to be a, at least a basic concern for, for fashion uh, involved as well. Uh, so we've got our underlayers, our shirts, our falling bands, our stockings, the garters to keep them up. We uh, also see in terms of, of underlayers layering for warmth pretty commonly in the time period. Uh, and so Captain Smith includes uh, that you should have a waistcoat or, or, or waistcoat as, as the pronunciation will evolve into. And uh, that at this time, it's a, it's a term that, that evolves, or at least the, 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 the garment that goes with the term will change throughout the centuries. At this time, it is a reference to a thermal layer, typically sleeveless, uh, worn underneath your doublet, underneath your suit. Uh, and we've got two different examples here, uh, both based on, on extant originals. We've got a knitted waistcoat, you can see with, with short sleeves. Um, and it's a pullover, so it just ties uh, snug around uh, around the neck there. So again, that would be worn uh, underneath uh, of the doublet to add that extra layer of, of insulation to the core. Uh, so again, knitted of wool. Um, and then we've got uh, a tailored uh, fabric, uh, two layer again, wool and uh, uh, and flannel. Um, and in this case, tying all the way up the front. Uh, rather than uh, being a, a pullover, but both of those garments, of course, intended to go underneath the doublet um, for that extra layer of, of warmth in, in cold weather as well. Um, now, when it comes to the clothing itself, your, your outer you know, outfit, if you will, uh, he includes only three. And that may not sound like a lot of clothing from a modern perspective. Most of us have closets and dressers and everything full of, of clothes, um, as substantially more than even a lot of people in the upper classes might have owned in this time period. But uh, Captain Smith figures you can get through on three suits of clothes. Um, he suggests a suit of canvas, which uh, we've got here. Um, and in this case, it's linen canvas. It could just as easily be hemp canvas at the time. And this is going to be your your work clothes. You know, think of it like the uh, um, the, the 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 you know kind of mechanics coveralls of the time period, if you will. You know, I mean, this this is your your laboring clothing. It's meant to be uh, tough and hard wearing. Uh, very commonly going to be undyed because, especially as linen canvas, it will be easier to launder than your woolen stuff. So it makes sense. This is what you're going to wear when you are doing your filthiest work. If you have to launder outer clothes, this is the one you want to do it to. Um, and so giving you that, um, uh, that option to be able to, again, maintain a, a hygienic and, and, and cleanly lifestyle, um, even in the wilds of Virginia. So that canvas set of clothes is going to be your, uh, <clears throat> again, your laboring clothing, your work clothes, uh, and could be worn you know, in any season um, especially if you've got the, the thermal layer of that waistcoat to layer underneath if, if you're working in the cold. Um, and then it says a suit of frieze, um, which is going to be typically frieze with reference to coarse, heavy, and often inexpensive uh, woolen cloth, or at least comparatively inexpensive woolen cloth. And that's going to be essentially your, your winter clothes. A heavy, coarse, almost uh, often akin to blanketing. Um, again, very practical. It's hard wearing, it's tough, it's quite warm, um, and this may go a, a decent ways to, to explaining why he doesn't see fit to, to bother including the need for a coat on the list. For one thing, again, it's important to bear in mind this list is not necessarily saying these are the only things you need in Virginia. These are the things you absolutely must have if you don't have already presuming that a person might have already uh, you know, own other clothing items in addition 
to this list. They might be bringing, they might well have a coat, but if you've got a suit of that heavy duty freeze wool material and that west coat, uh, waistcoat and waistcoat underneath, you're gonna be pretty warm in most weather. He also refers to a suit of cloth. Of course, modern day, we're gonna use the word cloth as a very generic term, but at the time, cloth specifically refers to somewhat more of a refined woolen fabric. Um, kind of a medium weight, you know, not terribly heavy, not super light either, uh, but a, uh, a, a more practical um, woolen cloth for, uh, you know, warmer weather. And uh, again, the wool, very hard wearing fabric. So it's a, um, going to be a practical, um, a practical fabric. Uh, and again, not terribly expensive. The cloth probably, uh, the cloth suit, uh, probably gonna be the most expensive of the three. Uh, but England's chief export at the time being woolen textiles, wool fabric in general, it's not gonna be terribly difficult to come by for these folks. Um, and so you've got your three suits, basically your, your warm weather clothing, your cold weather clothing, and your work clothing. And at this time, it is very typical for the doublet and the breeches to be pointed together, to be tied together, so that the doublet keeps the breeches up, the breeches keep the doublet down, Belts are not commonly used to hold your pants up in this time period. Your pants, first of all, should be fitted to you so they stay up on their own, but pointing a suit together uh, is, is the norm. Belts typically uh, used for carrying stuff. We'll see later on in Smith's list uh, of recommendations a belt included with a sword, for instance, for the carriage of the sword. Uh, but for keeping your, your clothing together, keeping your breeches up and your, your doublet riding where it should be, he suggests a dozen points. Um, so again, those laces to be used to uh, point it together. Now these are linen, uh, woven linen tape with, with aglets on them, which is extremely common at the time. Aglets have been found, uh, a fairly large number of aglets have been found archeologically in Virginia. Uh, mine are, uh, are woolen tape um, without any fixtures on the end. They're, they're hidden underneath of the, the tabs of the doublet. Um, you will see doublets cut to, again, hide the points. You will see doublets cut uh, to show uh, the points. Again, no real standardization at the time, um, but having those, those points to keep your, your various, and he says only a dozen, so you're going to be using those points on whichever suit you're wearing at the moment is, is, is his thinking. Um, you know, move them around. Um, but uh, the last thing, of course, Again, we talk about the, the hygienic practices at the time. Uh, no Englishman would have, at that time, considered himself to be fully dressed, appropriately dressed, or healthily dressed without having something on his head. Going about with your head uncovered. For all that we tend to see it done in the movies, because of course they want us to be able to see the actors' faces uh, in many, many eras prior to our own, going about with your head uncovered was not only considered unfashionable, but was considered unhealthy. Um, to insulate yourself against the, uh, your environment was considered necessary to maintain good health. And the head cover that John Smith specifies is a Monmouth cap, probably the single most common head covering in England at the time. Uh, again, no exact standardization. Uh, knitted, uh, almost invariably, um, and knitted of wool. And uh, you know, you'll see them heavy and coarse, you'll see them light and fine. You'll see them in some cases with a little bit of a decorative pattern worked in, in some cases very straightforward. Some cases they've got a bit of a brim on them, some cases not. Many times they've got a loop knitted into the brim and a button in the top, but not always. It, it, it varies quite a bit. But that basic Monmouth cap was the one piece of headgear that John Smith sees fit to include in the list. And again, it is probably the most single common uh, uh, head covering in England at the time. It's another one of those things that I often wondered about when I was looking at this list as this is all you're going to have in Virginia. I was, why on earth wouldn't you want a hat with a brim in the heat of Virginia? But of course, again, we're looking at this as Smith saying, this is the absolute minimum you have to have. Most everybody's gonna have some kind of, of hat in addition to a cap uh, at the time. So presumably you're gonna be coming with something that's got a brim that will keep the sun off your, off your face, off your neck, uh, which is going to be extremely important for an Englishman in the heat of Virginia, but uh, especially for anybody laboring outdoors under the heat of the sun and that kind of thing. Um, but he says, absolutely, got to have that Monmouth cap. You got to be able to protect your head. 
Now that covers pretty much everything uh, that he has included uh, on his list of clothing recommendations. And it's it takes up a lot of space here, but at the end of the day, it's really not that much stuff. You know, three pairs of underwear, three pairs of stockings, four pairs of shoes, three outfits, a hat, and that's pretty much it. Um, but uh, for a lot of the colonists coming here, and especially in the earliest years as members of the Virginia Company, you're not provided much space to bring belongings with you. So not only are belongings going to be, individual belongings going to cost more at the time, and that's one of the other nice things about Smith's list of recommendations. He actually breaks down the cost of all of these items um, from uh, you know, the, uh, the suit of cloth uh, being probably the single most expensive thing on here at 15 shillings uh, to the, uh, the, the, the dozen points only being three pence. Uh, but he breaks down the cost for everything on there. Um, so your individual belongings, you know, gonna, gonna cost a little bit more than a lot of them do for us today. So you're not gonna have huge volumes anyway, but you're also gonna be limited in what kind of room you have to bring things with you to Virginia. Well, that's everything that John Smith, at least, considers to be absolutely vital where apparel is concerned. And, uh, of course, such a, a list of suggestions is going to be invaluable for prospective colonists in England wondering what to spend their money on, how to prepare themselves for coming to Virginia, or even for an organization like the Virginia Company that's going to be sending uh, employees, essentially, indentures to the new world. What should we be providing for them? Um, but it's also, of course, invaluable for us as historians four centuries later to give us better insight into what's going on here. I mean, we know a lot about 17th century English clothing in England at the time, uh, but there's a lot less resource available when we're looking specifically at English 17th century clothing in Virginia. So it's one thing to be able to say, well, this is what they're doing in England, so we presume they're doing something similar here, but to then have such a... a, a, a a clear-cut list from someone like John Smith, who was here, who had substantial experience. You know, no, it's not a list that this is what every single person has, but it is a list of what he feels every single person needs. Uh, and that is such a valuable resource for us um, as we talk about what these folks were up to, as we try to dress ourselves appropriately here at this Living History site. Uh, and of course, very useful for us from a modern perspective as well, in that he prices all of these items out. He gives us a great insight into the cost uh, of uh, getting a colonist to Virginia, sustaining them for a year. And that's something we're going to look at more heavily in a future installment as we look at the rest of John Smith's list of suggestions. Uh, as all of the equipment going along with the clothing, the cost of all of that, and uh, you know, get the cost of, of even just getting it across the ocean, freighting it here. So keep an eye out for a future installment uh, as we peruse the rest of John Smith's suggestions. If you liked what you saw today, today, uh, of course, as always, like, share, and subscribe, and leave us questions and comments down below. We always love to hear from you, and uh, we'll see you next time.